Welcome to the European Parliamentary Research Service Podcasts. In this podcast, we'll talk about the increasing frequency and intensity of extreme weather events due to global warming. We'll analyze risks and impacts and try to spell out three possible scenarios for the future. Stay with us. Deadly floods in Germany and Belgium, uncontrolled wildfires in Greece, Portugal, Italy and France. Extreme weather events like this shook Europe in 2021. But unfortunately, they're not one-off incidents. And scientists have linked these increases to the human-induced global warming. Earth's average surface air temperature has increased by about 1 degree Celsius since 1900. And this figure will reach 1.5 degrees before 2040. And there's an even more frightening estimate. Assuming we implement all our current climate commitments, our planet will be 2.4 degrees warmer by the end of the century. If we don't, it could be more than 3 degrees Celsius. And with global temperatures rising, we will not only have to deal with more extreme weather events, but also face the long-term impacts of a changing climate. Beyond wildfires and floods, violent storms, even hurricanes, prolonged droughts and extreme heat waves are Europe's main extreme weather events, and their impact depends largely on what happens and especially where it happens. For instance, when we have heat waves hitting major parts of the continent or floods and landslides occurring in cities, the human and economic costs are of an entirely different magnitude. The total cost of the July 2021 floods, for instance, is about 46 billion euros. And heat waves are by far the deadliest event. Yes, they are. But beyond the direct human and material losses caused by extreme weather events, there are innumerable other impacts and risks that need to be considered. Extreme heat can melt asphalt and buckle rails. Flooding can lead to the contamination of drinking water. Storms and wildfires can disrupt power supplies and put critical infrastructures like hospitals at risk. And there's reason for concern. According to the Science Direct Research Platform, the annual damage to critical infrastructure in the EU due to climate change alone will triple this decade. And most affected will be the industry, transport and energy sectors. We've spoken to the Joint Research Centre's senior scientist, Elizabeth Kaufman. Climate hazards like floods, storms or fires threaten our industry and critical infrastructure and we have already seen major impacts. This risk is affected by regional changes in climate and more extreme weather events. Consider that 40% of the world's oil and gas reserves face severe climate risk, and the expected yearly climate losses in EU energy and transport may increase tenfold by the end of the century. To avoid damage and ensure supply security under such conditions, we need to build climate resilience into our infrastructure. So, what about the long-term impacts of a changing climate? Changing seasonal characteristics, such as permanently warmer winters or frequent droughts, will have deep impacts on many sectors, especially tourism, agriculture and fisheries. Ski stations in southern European countries may see their season shortened or even have to close down, leaving many without an income. Warmer waters may push fish away, affecting fishing communities. But most importantly, warmer temperatures and frequent droughts may increase soil desertification, endangering crops and further threatening food security. At a global level, ripple effects in complex supply chains can also lead to supply scarcity and push prices up. That's right. Hence the need to increase the resilience of global supply chains. But the insurance and finance industry has an equally big task ahead. We've spoken to Patrick Sarna, head of macro strategy at Swiss insurance giant Swiss RE. Our analysis shows that climate change has no winners. And under a severe scenario, we estimate that the global economy could lose almost a fifth of global GDP by mid-century. So to build climate resilience, governments and businesses need to recognize that the time to act is now. A key point that needs to be addressed is obviously around taxonomy, because a common framework for what counts as green and how to measure progress to avoid greenwashing of capital flows is really important. And in addition, climate risk analysis needs to be much more deeply embedded in risk pricing, in risk assessment, and also in economic analysis, because typically, currently, this isn't done on an economy-wide basis. 
What's clear is that if we want to make the EU less vulnerable to climate change, proactive adaptation and risk management measures are crucial. Here's Lieselot Jensen from the European Parliamentary Research Service. This is a policy area of increasing awareness, and luckily in the EU we have a lot of data to support us. Member states report directly on their risks and vulnerabilities and receive input from the Commission to strengthen their resilience. We get early warnings from our satellite monitoring and from collaboration between national weather services, and we share this information widely and use it in training for disaster preparedness and response. Yet all the data in the world will not stop the forces of nature, and we must ensure the appropriate responses and risk awareness on the ground. We still have some room for improvement. So, how bad can things get? Well, that would depend on what actions we take and how they may work out. So here are three potential scenarios. We could call the first one an unsettled outlook with sunny spells. In this short-term scenario, the increase in extreme weather events would generate some level of awareness that would lead to some quick fixes. But decisive action and systemic change would still be lacking. In a second scenario, a series of extreme weather events could cause many deaths and serious damage. This would prompt governments to take action in order to prevent future damage. From upgrading protective infrastructure and adopting high standards against floods, heat waves and droughts to setting up global early warning systems. In this scenario, which we would call an improving forecast with scattered showers, EU taxonomy would direct investments towards low-carbon solutions and emission reductions would spread across the economy, with the EU taking a leading international role. Now, while this approach is quite effective at preventing damage, the costs for citizens and public authorities would be, in some cases, prohibitive. But let's look at the third scenario, the perfect storm. In this scenario, the world has failed to deliver on its climate commitments, and disastrous global warming unfolds. The North and South Poles are melting, the world's forests burn like never before, and the greenhouse gases released by such events further accelerate climate change, reaching tipping points. The tsunami of impacts with cascading effects seems unstoppable. The EU increases development aid to help countries cope with famine and conflicts while trying to keep climate refugees away from its borders through negotiations with neighboring countries. Meanwhile, inside the Union, prolonged droughts threaten crops and food supply in southern Europe and extreme weather events disrupt critical infrastructure and cause massive damage claims to insurers. Moreover, heat waves and floods claim thousands of lives, put stress on health systems and reduce worker productivity. Ultimately, disrupted supply chains, low outputs and damages, unleash bankruptcies and financial chaos unfolds, leaving the EU unable to raise recovery packages to help ailing companies and citizens. So, let's hope the perfect storm never unfolds. What this goes to show beyond the three scenarios is that the EU will face major impacts from climate change if we do not take serious action now. And there is no time to lose. Want to know more? Check out Lieselot Jensen's full policy brief on the EPRS website or in our app. This is a European Parliamentary Research Service podcast. Thanks for listening.